This was the state of play. The blades were now shaped. Tom's, you can see, was just three inches longer, but this made a huge difference to the way it handled, and I could tell our swords apart at a glance from the other end of the workshop. This is not the first time I've ever tried to forge a sword. This is, in fact, the second. The first time was many years ago when I was 17 years old at school, and I managed to get hold of a car leaf spring. And I thought, wow, that could, that, I could forge a sword out of that. And um, my metalwork teacher let me use the forge. And so I uh, had it like this, heating in the coals, and I was going to beat it on an anvil and turn it into a sword. Uh, I had not a lot of idea about what I was doing. I wasn't particularly confident, but hell, I was going to give it a go. But it went wrong. I got almost nowhere because as I was heating my leaf spring, Katie Arnander, yes, Katie Arnander, you if you're watching, Katie Arnander came to the, 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 the door to the metal workshop, which was right next to the forge, and started talking to me. Now, Katie was distractingly good looking and I left it in for too long. And when it came out, when it came out, it looked like a flipping sparkler. It looked like this. Katie, do you remember? It looked like this, didn't it? And I put it on the anvil thinking, oh no, what do I do, what do I do? And I hit it and it broke and fell in two. And a glowing bit of orange metal landed on the, on the floor and someone who was visiting, uh, her dog walked out and just didn't tread on the hot bit, thank goodness, and went out. And my, the half of the sword I had left, I thought, what do I do with this? Didn't know what I was doing. And I plunged it into a bucket of water huge amount of steam blinded me and then to my amazement there was a dry bucket there. I boiled a, a bucket of water dry and um, I said to my metalwork teacher, uh, now what do I do? And he took one look at it and said, oh, no, that's it, it's over, it's all gone crystalline, it's stuffed and uh, we didn't find another leaf spring and that was it, that was the end. Katie, that was the end of my first sword but this sword will not suffer the same fate, no. We fetched in an extra long heater from outside, as well as this old gas cylinder filled with vegetable oil. It was time for some heat treatment. Now we started, if you remember, with a, uh, a rectangular section bar, and there's pretty much not a molecule of that bar now that is where it started off. Everything has been drawn out and, and bashed in and, and beveled and so forth. Um, and so there's, there's no part of the, the surface of this which was the, the surface of that bar. Um, so it's covered in scale at the moment. We're going to take the scale off um, as part of the preparation for the next stage. It's going to go into this, which is a, a long burner with, with five gas jets that's going to sit on the... Uh, the sword is going to sit on the, this fire brick bed here. We've got to get that nice and flat uh, because if it doesn't lie flat on that, then as this heats, it can settle down or onto that warped surface and itself warp. The idea of this thing is we can heat the whole sword all at once and that will, all going well, even out all the stresses because we've been heating this, heating this up in little, little bits. So this bit expands as it heats relative to its neighbouring bit and where, where the, the join between the, the fast expanding part is and the, the, its colder neighbour, the stresses can build up and then we've been whacking the hot bits with hammers and that of course shifts metal around and again builds up all sorts of stresses. So there are all sorts of stresses and strains in this that we don't know about. It's, it's unpredictable. Um, so what we're trying to do now is even everything out. Heat it all up to a temperature and let the whole metal relax and even out and average out all the stresses. So there's no particularly stressed point because the next thing we can do after that is temper it, which involves plunging it into this big bath of oil. It's uh, just like cooking oil, quite ordinary oil. It's going to go in tip down like that, not the tang, and uh, that's quite a heat shock. And if there is some bit where there's a big buildup of stress and you then stress it loads more by uh, uh, suffering it, uh, getting it to suffer this heat shock, you can then do serious damage to it. So we don't want that, so we're going to even it out, get it relaxed, and then temper it. I scraped off the scale with a motorised tool. Yes, not exactly medieval, but neither was having no apprentices to do it for me. And not having the plague. I don't like this. <laughs> I 
see now why you asked me to step back. I had to shift the blades back and forth to get an even heat because the spots of temperature immediately under the five burners were hotter than in between. We got the steel blades hot enough to recrystallize and then let the stresses even out as they slowly cooled. This process is called normalization, which is similar to annealing, but that takes hours. At the end of normalization, the steel is fairly soft for steel, and all the stresses from hammering and deforming the crystals were in theory, gone. The next process is a bit nerve-wracking. It's perhaps the most critical one. Uh, this is the quenching. Um, I'm going to be taking my sword and it will go in there and get extremely hot. And then I have to take it out from there. I'll put it onto its edge like that so that it supports its own weight a bit better. Bring it towards me uh, wearing tongs. It'll be very, very hot, slightly hotter than it needs to be for the quench because it'll be cooling the instant it gets out and all going well once I've finally got it into position it'll be down to the ideal temperature. With a second pair of tongs, uh, all held in thickly gloved hands, I will then support its weight, bring it to the vertical without bending it because it'll be very dangerously soft at this point, and then in one swift movement I dunk it into this oil here, quenching it. And I then bring it up and down a bit, which uh, speeds up the, uh, the quenching movement. If I were to move it that way, like a paddle, uh, the friction on the, the weight of the, uh, of the oil could actually warp it again. This will have the effect of hardening it, uh, which is what you want on a sword blade so that it can hold a, an edge and so forth. Um, but I won't be dunking in the, the tang because we don't want that to go brittle. It then comes out. It's still very hot. And I will then hand over to Tom because he's uh, enormously more experienced uh, than I am. And he will, if he sees any warp in it, uh, very quickly get rid of that warp. He'll have about 15 seconds uh, to, to get rid of the warp, uh, otherwise we'll be in trouble. So um, it's an important part of the process of getting a really good sword, um, but a uh, bit nerve wracking. Uh, but I thought that, you know, I really want to go through this because it's such a critical part of the whole process. I can't really say I've forged a sword unless I've, I've done the quench myself. Um, I've had a rehearsal uh, with a cold sword, and I'm going to watch Tom do his first, and then it'll be my turn. Um, eek. God, it's so soft. It's so soft. Yeah. This time, we heat the sword hot enough such that the carbon in it goes into solution, and then we quench it and cool it so fast that the carbon doesn't have time to come out of the solution and form perlite. Instead, it stays in the steel and hardens it. The outside of the sword cools fastest and goes hardest. If you were to cool it too fast, by, for instance, dunking it in water, then the whole thing would go brittle right the way through. St Dunstan, patron saint of smiths, do not fail me now. As he comes, I grab, I turn, I slide horizontally, I support in the middle, I bring vertical, get rid of one. Bring up, straight down. Yeah, beautiful. Hold for a second, flame on, start waggling up and down, just touching the tang. Fine. Okay, the flame's off already, you yeah. tell me when. Yeah. There's still a bit of glow in the tang. That's fine. Tell me when. Hello. Suddenly the workshop smelled like a chip shop. Okay now. Thank you, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. Well done, well done. Well done. <laughs> ah, I'm glad they didn't chicken out of that. So then, after it cooled again, 
I washed off the oil and saw that it was all covered in scale again. This would have to come off. That's the thing I use. Ah, you have to rock it back before pushing it. You didn't tell me. I, it's not something I was really aware of. Ah. I needed the blade shiny because I needed to be able to see the exact colour of the surface of the steel to be able to judge its temperature in the next stage, the tempering. Tom went first to show me the way. Using a blowtorch, a little bit of the blade is heated until it turns what smiths call straw, the golden brown colour you see appearing here. Then, to avoid overheating, the next bit of the blade is heated to the same colour and as this happens, conducted heat further increases the temperature of the bit just heated, which then turns blue. The blue follows you down the blade. You have to be very vigilant. Get any one bit too hot and there will be a soft patch in the blade. Will I set fire to my socks? Now I think what really upset me was that Katie actually found it funny. And there are some things that are difficult to forgive. Anyway, I now have a blue sword. It won't stay blue. It's been made blue uh, so that I know that I've heated it to the right temperature. It may look really cool. You may think, oh, he's made a blue sword. That's great. Oh, that's really cool. I want one like that. Uh, but no, it's not going to stay blue. It'll, be, it'll, be, uh, it'll finish uh, polished into a silvery sheen, like a proper knight sword. Yes! Had it failed that test, it would have cracked. So it's a good test. Or stay bent. Or stay, oh yeah, or stay bent. True, true. And it's, uh, it has got a little bit of a wonk in it, actually, you know. There. But that wonk was there But that's not, that's not where I put my knee. So it didn't come from what I just did. Huzzah! Hooray. <laughs> <laughs>